All right, I think we are back up and running now. So I had a, um, I, I had a misconfiguration on my end this time. Live, live is never easy. I've been changing my configurations around so much. It's been, it's been a little crazy. OK, so we are about to watch the launch of the SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket, uh, which is, of course, carrying uh, two astronauts to orbit. And I'm just waiting for my uh, Amazon stream to start up here. There we go. And we're going to go live on Amazon in 3, 2, 1. And we are up and running on Amazon. Uh, so what I've done today to cover today's launch uh, is I have a link in the YouTube description that'll take you over to my Amazon page. And if you go over there, um, you can see some stuff that I think is great for kids to, you know, to really continue whatever interest they're going to get from watching this today. So we've got Kerbal Space Program. We've got some SDs model rockets. Maybe we'll talk a little bit about that stuff in a little bit. Uh, and if you're just joining me, um, I just was listening to the NASA TV live feed here. And I'll pull it up on screen for you. Uh, and the astronauts are, are all buckled in. The weather is now a go, which is great. And one of the things that happens in Florida, because I've been to a few of these launches now, is that uh, the weather can be very localized. So even if the weather looks horrible one minute, it might clear up. And you might have enough of a, of a hold to shoot your rocket out through and get out into space. And it looks like right now the uh, weather on the ground is good. The upper level winds are good. And it looks like I think they're going to be able to get there today. Uh, now, the two astronauts you see strapped in there are uh, Robert Behnken, who's a veteran astronaut. He was on STS-123. It's a space shuttle mission in 2008. And also STS-130 in 2010, uh, which is another space shuttle flight. Doug Hurley is the other astronaut on this flight. He was on STS-127 in 2009. And he was also one of the astronauts on the last space shuttle flight, STS-135, that launched in 2011. And I actually went to that launch. In fact, I went to the last three space shuttle launches. So that is um, something I'm going to talk about on Monday on the wrap-up. I've got some stuff I can just show you from all of those visits that we did before. Uh, now, what I'm going to do here real quick is give you kind of a rundown as to what's happened so far today. Uh, one of the best parts about covering NASA missions is that the footage is all public domain, so we can use this stuff without uh, any issues. So uh, I got some clips earlier of the crew heading out to the launch pad. Uh, of course, this being a SpaceX mission, which is uh, run by Elon Musk, they are taking uh, Teslas <laughs> to the launch pad. Now, as this is rolling here, um, this route that they're taking, uh, when I go to the Space uh, Center to cover launches, uh, this is the route that we take as media to get to the press site. And I can tell you, it's really cool to be able to drive up to the Kennedy Space Center and just be allowed in. <laughs> it's pretty amazing with your press pass. Uh, and what we're, we're going to see here as these cars roll around, there's a parking lot there. Um, there's a turn off uh, to the right, just past that building there. And that's where you turn in for the press site. And we're allowed to stay in just the press site area. You can't just go wandering around in anywhere you want. It is a very secure facility. And as you can see, they've got an armored personnel carrier following the astronauts. And actually, that's one of the things they've got for security. They also have a guy in a helicopter with a sniper rifle. So uh, they don't mess around on security when uh, you go to the launches. And this was earlier today. Uh, the spacesuits, I learned, uh, were something that were designed by a Hollywood uh, costume designer because Elon Musk wanted something that looked different than uh, the more military-looking suits that they've typically worn, which were more utilitarian. Uh, my understanding is these are just as safe, and they're integrated with the spaceship that they'll be getting into. And this gives you a sense of scale, too, because that is the, um, uh, the vehicle that pulls the rocket out to the pad from their building there. Um, and they're taking a photo right before they get on. And the um, Falcon 9 and the Dragon on top of it is actually taller than the space shuttle was. So what you're going to see here is they're going to go into this elevator. And, and I'm keeping an ear out for uh, any developments on the launch front. And uh, they're going to go into the elevator here. The elevator was actually pretty quick. I was surprised how fast it was. Now, um, a friend of mine who uh, was working with me on coverage way back in the day got to go to the pad when the shuttle was on the pad a while back. And it must have been amazing to see that. So um, here they go. They're going to go in the elevator. This is from earlier today. And uh, then you'll see them come out the other side there. I think I should have cut the clip a little bit earlier. OK, so there they are. They're coming out of the elevator. 
And normally, I think if the shuttle was there, they would get onto the, uh, the gantry right out of the elevator. Um, but because Dragon's higher, they have to go up some stairs after they get out there. Uh, the fellows in, in uh, black there are the support crew. And I kind of like the contrast that they've developed with these uniforms, so you really can't miss the astronauts here, can you? And there they go. This is, again, earlier today. And we've got about a half hour before the, the launch happens, so I figured I'd give you some, some commentary. Um, and then this is when they got loaded into the Dragon capsule. And there's only two of them. I guess for the NASA missions, they are going to take um, up to four. But the Dragon capsule can actually support seven. And there's apparently a bathroom on board, which I did not know of <laughs> before. So there is a bathroom. And apparently it's some newly designed toilet, but there hasn't been a lot of uh, coverage of that toilet just yet. And you'll see that panel in front of them. There's no joystick or anything. This is all touch panel driven. And there are some buttons below it also. And then uh, what I didn't get on the, on the video here is that once they get them locked into the seats, the seats actually rotate up towards the screen. So they're, they're pretty much looking at that screen the whole time and it's brought like almost right in front of them. But the, chair, the chairs they're in actually slide up. And you can see next to the, astronaut, the far astronaut there on the right, there's another seat there. And then where the camera is, is the, other, is, is the fourth seat. So if you had four astronauts going up, they'd sit in, in line with each other there. And they're going to be in that for, I guess the trip is going to be 19 hours from start to finish. There are ways to get to the space station faster than that. Um, but I think they are trying to really put this ship through its paces and be very careful about it. Um, I think the Soyuz can get there now in, in just a couple of hours. And it's all timing. It's all math. <laughs> it's very complicated stuff. That's why the uh, Kerbal Space Program is a great, uh, a great thing for your kids to check out because it, it, it requires you to learn the math involving orbiting and learning how to rendezvous with spacecraft and that sort of thing. It's really, it's really kind of fun. And uh, yep, they're getting uh, buckled in there. Again, this is earlier today. They're already strapped in and ready to go at this point. The, uh, the rocket's getting fueled. And that was that. And what I thought might be fun also, um, I think that's going to come up next here, is to take a look at, yeah, there we go. This is the facility. Um, so what you're seeing here is uh, how this facility is laid out. Let me rewind it here for a second. So this building here is where they, they get the rockets stacked. Now, if you recall, if you followed NASA before, they have that big vehicle assembly building. Well, the space shuttle and the Saturn V, they were all stacked on top of each other. Um, but SpaceX does theirs uh, horizontally, and then they roll it out uh, to the pad. But you can see the pad is not very far um, from the building that they're operating from. So it's, uh, it's a pretty close drive there. And bear with me for one second here, folks, because the... Oh, there it goes. It's cool. I just want to make sure our NASA feed didn't go down here. Um, and then they drive them out there and they go right up. So the launch pad is about three miles from the press site where we watch these launches from. And I've got a map here that I can show you real quick if you're curious. Uh, let me pull that up real quick here. Um, and that is on camera nine here. Um, and this is where the press tip, uh, this is the vehicle assembly building. The press site is right over here. And you can see that's the press site. I got arrows in there. Um, and then you've got a three mile uh, viewpoint to the launch pad. But um, it's so flat in Florida that you can really see things pretty decently there. So it's not too hard to uh, get a good view of a launch. And on Monday, I'll, I'll do my wrap up video and kind of show you some, some neat stuff. So we got 167 watching right now. I've got some more stuff to show you if you're interested because uh, we went to a uh, launch of the Falcon Heavy last year, and that was a lot of fun. Um, and I can actually show you uh, the piece that we shot there. Let me turn the hey audio Hey, everybody, up here. it's Lon Seidman. We are on location today at a very cool location, the Kennedy Space Center's Launch Complex 39A. Uh, we are not very far and from so this the is, launch pad let me pause where this for the Falcon. Here. Um, so, this is what it looks like from the ground. Um, you know, you saw the aerial shot, so this is what it looks like from the ground. Now, the Falcon Heavy is two is actually three of these these falcon nines that are going up today strapped together so you have 27 Heavy engines behind it's crazy me is going to rocket off into space 
uh, with a satellite that weighs about 6,000 kilograms. It's very heavy, and therefore it requires a very heavy-duty rocket to get it into space. And SpaceX has been doing a lot to make these launches a lot more affordable. And one of the things that this rocket's going to do is lift off the pad, and then most of it is going to come back. And later today, when it launches, we're going to witness that from the NASA press site, and we're also going to witness those cores coming back down. So those two rockets on the side there will detach a little bit into the launch. They will then come back down to Earth, and we'll watch that from the press site. The center core will also return, but it's going to land on a barge in the ocean. You've probably seen that happen before, but we'll see those two boosters on the side come down uh, at the same time. Now, what we're going to do is give you a look at what it's like to see a launch from a viewer's perspective. You can get much better imagery on the SpaceX channel, of course, but we're going to give you an idea as to what it might be like if you're here uh, looking with your own eyes. And our cameras will see about what our eyes will see and our recorders will record what our ears hear. Now, so, um, and this is, by the way, not the mission we're watching today. This was the, uh, the prior Falcon Heavy SpaceX mission. has completely refurbished this launch pad. Uh, they've branded it. As you can see, it's got a nice new uh, black color to it. And up at the top there, you're going to see a walkway that is designed for astronauts to walk into the SpaceX crewed Dragon spacecraft that they tested not too long ago. That is going to take astronauts very shortly to the International Space Station, and they're going to walk down that uh, walkway there into their Dragon spaceship and go to the space station. That is what this pad is going to be used for in addition to launching those Falcon heavies. Now, one of the things that F SpaceX is really focused on is cost reduction. And the way they do that, first of all, is reusing those rocket cores. When they come back down, they don't just land for the sake of landing. They refurbish them and send them back up again. These three will be flying for the first time, but if they do come back successfully, they will most likely fly again on future SpaceX missions for their commercial customers or for NASA or the U.S. government. Interestingly, too, in that building behind me, they assembled the rockets horizontally, so they don't have to stack them up like uh, some of their competitors do. It allows them to work more easily with the rocket. They can actually spin it around in there uh, to get all the things that they need from the ground mostly, and they've been very good at introducing a lot of efficiencies uh, into modern space transit, transit, and I think it's going to be very interesting to see how other competitors respond to this. Uh, yesterday, we took a tour of the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, there's another commercial startup called Blue Origin that is headed up by Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos. They have assembled an enormous building here. Uh, they're also going to be working on uh, some of their own launches from Cape Canaveral very shortly as well. So this is a very exciting time for space transportation, and it's very exciting to be here, especially at the launch pad of all places. They won't let us get this close for the launch itself, but we will be bringing that to you very shortly, hopefully. Uh, so stay tuned, and we'll have some great views of the launch from the NASA press site. All right. So, uh, yes, yeah, so that was the Falcon Heavy mission, but that gives you an idea as to what the launch pad looks like. And I got some questions in here. Uh, some folks are wondering if I am at the launch today. I am not. I, was, I would have loved to have gone, but they've um, certainly reduced the amount of media that they're supporting there, so uh, we were not able to do that. But let me show you what it looks like um, from the launch pad and what you would typically see. Um, so I'm going to just get this video queued up to the right spot here. Um, and here, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to pause this right when it starts, just so I can give you Three seconds to go. Okay, so this is what from three miles away at the press site, this is typically what you would see if you were looking with your eyes. So they do have some trees in the way there, um, but it, it actually, you know, for three miles away, it's pretty close. So when you get down there and cover this, I think it's certainly something that you can get a good experience from. Um, one thing to note uh, is that this is not just for the press. So NASA has a program called NASA Social and if you sign up for NASA Social and you know, keep an eye on their Twitter feeds and stuff, they have, uh, for just about every mission, they invite people to come to the press site uh, to watch these launches and other NASA events. They're really fun things to go and do. And if you um, enjoy this and want to be a part of it, uh, keep an eye on those NASA Socials because that's how I got started doing some of this stuff. And actually, it was kind of the catalyst that led to the, the channel launching. Um, and that's a pun, right? 
Uh, so it's definitely something you should check out because you get a really good view. So let's take a look at the Falcon Heavy launch. Again, this is not so the launch we're, we're watching Heavy today. This is the, the one pad. that already happened last year that I went to. It is go for launch, according to my friend over there. So we are 30 seconds to go here, 29 seconds. It's going to be an exciting thing to see. Remember, the first thing we're going to see is a lot of smoke coming out of the back of that rocket. Uh, we won't hear much for about 20 seconds until after those engines start up. So it's going to probably lift off the pad before we hear anything over here. Uh, we do have a lot of different audio recorders going, and hopefully everything is going to work out. We've got a couple of cameras running, too. Uh, and here we go. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. And we should have seen something by now. It looks like they're not doing it today. Oh, there it goes. I'm sorry. <laughs> we thought we'd see more smoke already. There it goes. Wow, is that bright. It was crazy bright. And that's and one that's of the, the things one thing that you, you can't go. appreciate uh, on TV is just the brightness of these rockets. And now the sound is coming. Listen to that. So we're hearing the sound echo back from the vehicle assembly building behind us. It is bright and loud. Look at it go. Remember, this is the Falcon Heavy from last year, in case you're just tuning in. This is not the launch yet. <laughs> just doing a recap. So this is, um, again, this is what you would see with your eyes. It's, hey, for a it's heavy payload, cool. that thing just went off the pad. Wow. That was something. It didn't look like it was going to go at first, but I'm glad it did because I had to go home tomorrow. Okay, what we should be seeing soon are the boosters separating. And you can see it now beginning to arc over. And I'm going to fast forward a little bit here to the, uh, the last there. part here. So, uh, yep, um, so this is where they come back. So the other thing with the SpaceX rockets is that they, they attempt to recover the booster stages. And the, uh, the boosters most of the time come back in one piece. Now in Falcon Heavy, which we went to last year. All right, I'm gonna jump in here because we had a hard time finding the boosters after they separated. Watch it was pretty high up in. there. Uh, but we did catch them on the way down. So here you can see the initial burn briefly. As so they burn and then they, then they turn off and then they drop and then they turn the burn back they on again. They slow down the on their way on to the uh, landing zone. And then you can see just over the tree line, just how fast they drop. And then right when they hit the tree line, uh, they light up those engines. Now, the one thing I was surprised about was how long it took for the sound of that landing to reach us. You can hear me asking that question. And where's the sonic boom? <laughs> you, were looking the, you were looking the wrong way to get the ship I, coming down. <laughs> <laughs> there it goes. There go. Whoa. 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 Now, did, did you hear that, that echo back? Well, that was from the vehicle assembly building behind me. So it it was the loudest sonic boom I ever heard. And, and why you hear four, even though there's only two boosters, is that you're getting the sonic boom from the top and the bottom of the rocket of each of them. So it's bang, bang, and then bang, bang. Uh, the same thing would happen with the shuttle when it came in. And we saw the last landing of the shuttle as well. And that was really amazing. Um, again, I'm going to talk about all this on, on Monday. Uh, we're going to do, a, for my weekly wrap up, I'll give you a kind of a presentation of all the things that, that we went and covered. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's good stuff. Um, and it was really exciting just to be a part of all of that. And now you can see on the NASA feed here, let me pull this up, that that's that crew access arm that I showed you a few minutes ago in the, vi in the video from last year. And so that is pulled back. And you can see also the NASA press site is empty. If, um, you know, if this was not in the middle of a pandemic, this would be packed. And... Uh, the one that I went to, uh, well, I've been to, like I said, I've been to a bunch of them. Um, I was at uh, the last space shuttle launch, and that press site where the clock was um, is was full of people, and they had they had more people there than they had in many years. And part of the reason is is that uh, NASA provides so much high quality video footage that the TV networks don't send as much crew down as, than, as they used to because they would, back in the older day, olden days, um, they would have to provide most of their own cameras to cover the launch. Uh, but now because of the ease of digital video, NASA has been adding more and more cameras everywhere that they just make available. You can just plug in and get access to their video feeds. Um, so the, the media coverage has, has dropped down. Even though the coverage is still there, the people aren't. 
uh, but they've been um, you know, certainly more open to independent outlets. There's a huge community of space YouTubers that uh, cover this stuff, like the Everyday Astronaut and Scott Manley and many others. You can watch you know, your favorite YouTubers covering this stuff as well, and they've been very good about uh, getting the independent media in. Uh, and it's, uh, it's great. It's a great experience. Um, now, if you're watching on Amazon, I've got a few um, products here selected uh, that might be of, of interest for, for you and your kids, actually. Um, we are looking at about 20 minutes on the NASA feed, 18 minutes in reality. So my feed, is what, what I'm getting from NASA is, is delayed, and you're probably getting it a minute later also. <laughs> so, um, And I'll start uh, looking at some of the comments here in a minute. I'm just, I got so many things in front of me that I'm trying to keep track of here. But let me show you a couple of uh, Amazon product recommendations that I think are cool. Um, by the way, uh, when I was in fourth grade, when I was like 10 years old, um, you know, we were getting a lot of, of space stuff at school because this was the beginning of the space shuttle program. It inspired my love of technology and of media too, because I was watching this stuff on TV, right? Um, so we got into model rocketry at that time. And I actually, I can't believe they still make this. This is the Estes model rocket Alpha 3. And it is the same exact thing that I played with as a kid. This was my very first model rocket. It's still available. I think the color is different on it now, um, but it's otherwise like the same thing. Isn't this crazy? Um, 25 bucks, it works exactly the same way. They got these little um, solid rocket motors on them. And, you know, they're, they're dangerous if you're not careful. You gotta do it in a big field and stuff. But it's, um, it's really fun to, uh, to play with those things. And it, you, you have to learn, it, it, it really forces you to learn how rockets react in the weather, in the wind, and thinking about uh, how the wind might impact your trajectory and, and everything. It's really cool. And they come back on parachutes. And if you mess up, your rocket either gets lost. Um, they don't usually blow up unless you, you know, try to make them do that. Um, but, uh, you know, there's, there's consequences for bad design when you're playing with model rockets. And I think it's a really fun way to learn about this stuff in a, in a, safe, a safer way. Um, so let me take some uh, questions from the chat room. So we got 218 watching right now. Um, I'm just listening for the weather. My screen is over here, which is why I'm looking over here. Yeah, I'll put the sound on so you can hear too. Everything continues to be go for an on-time launch. Yeah, the weather's so looking Dan, much better. Dan, Jesse, things are looking pretty good. How are they doing over at your stand? Things are great from about 15 feet away from you, John. I and honestly, things are looking pretty great down at the pad. There, we're seeing a lot more blue in the sky. Green is the color we want when we're talking about weather, and that's where we're sitting right now. So we're continuing to count down. We are under 18 minutes away from liftoff. Again, it's an instantaneous liftoff um, at, uh, it's gonna be 12, 22 and 45 seconds here on the West Coast, 3, 22 and 45 seconds over on the East Coast there in Florida. Just a reminder, it's going to be about a nine minute ride up to orbit for the Falcon 9 and Bob and Doug on board Dragon. It'll be a two stage flight so we'll see the first stage fly until we hear Miko, or main engine cut off, about two and a half minutes into flight. After that, the second stage will take over and continue to power them the rest of the way. Second engine cutoff comes in just under nine minutes at about eight minutes. And by the way, they're going to be landing the first stage as well, and they're going to try to recover that first stage. That's what something SpaceX has been doing um, for a couple of years now, and they've been pretty uh, successful at doing that. Now, typically, when it goes to the space station, they land the, um, the first stage booster right at Cape Canaveral. So you remember just a few minutes ago when we were, we were watching the old video from last year, you saw those things coming down over the tree line. Um, they would have brought it normally back to that spot. Uh, but because the crew missions have to take a different trajectory to account for aborting the mission if they need to do that, uh, then they have, they have to put the first stage booster further out to sea, and there's not enough fuel on it to get it back to Cape Canaveral. So they're gonna land it on a barge in a little while. And actually what I'll do here is pull up a clip of the abort test that they did. Um, now this was um, a few months ago, and Seven, let me play this back six, here. I'm, I'm, and, five, and those of you in the chat, four, let's make sure that three, everyone knows two, that this is prior footage. Zero. I should have put up a graphic here, um, and I'm going to leave the, uh, the NASA thing inset here. And the reason is, is that 
Um, uh, the reason is I don't want people to feel be be scared that this is a, an, a, a, an aborted mission. It's not. This is this is the launch test from a few months ago. So what they did is they launched this very same, not this exact same capsule, but the same design, and they have rockets embedded on the capsule. So if there's a problem, it can rocket away from the first stage of the of, of the Falcon rocket so the, the crew can get away and be safe. And this was the last thing that they had to demonstrate uh, in order to be able to make this work. So here it goes. And then what they're going to do, again, this is a test from a few months ago. Um, what they're going to do is, is in a second or two, they're going to cut off the main engine on that first stage. And when they do that, you're going to see the uh, the Dragon capsule escape. It'll light its rockets automatically. It's pretty wild, actually, how cool this worked. And then, so you'll see those engines shut down in just a second. And then um, what's going to happen is the first stage is going to break up because it, it, the aerodynamic load on it will force it to break up. So there goes the engine. Now watch the top. See that, that little capsule there? It's rocketing away. And then the first stage is going to break up, and you'll see the fuel uh, getting out and igniting after that. And, it, and so this is not right now. This is from a few months ago. This was a test. Um, so this is not a, an explosion. This is just the test that they did to make sure that if this did happen, the astronauts would be safe. And this happened all autonomously. So they shut the, the first stage down, and that capsule just uh, blew away out of there. It was pretty crazy. So um, that's it. And, and then there's a parachute that will come, or actually four parachutes that will come out of the Dragon capsule and it'll take the astronauts back down. Um, and I can fast forward a little bit. By the way, um, they just interviewed uh, Gwen Shotwell, who is the head, the president of SpaceX. So Elon Musk is the CEO, um, but the uh, SpaceX day-to-day -day is, is run by a, a, a woman. A woman leader. She's uh, one of the head, you know, one of the one of the most uh, brightest stars in aerospace, and she's been a big part of making a lot of this work. So there you can see the trunk section of the capsule breaking away, and then the parachutes come out a short time later, and then they splash down in the ocean. So there you can see those parachutes coming out, and then they splash down. So that's what would happen, and we hope this doesn't happen today. Um, but if something did happen, uh, the astronauts are actually probably safer in this vehicle than they would have been in the space shuttle because the space shuttle had no way to get out. So if, if there was an accident on the way up with the space shuttle, the chances of the crew escaping um, were very slim. And they, they had ejection uh, seats on the shuttle initially for like the first three missions, and then they took them out. Uh, partly because they were probably a, a greater risk having them in the shuttle than not having them at all. Um, but this, this capsule here will rocket away if it needs to. So we've got 12 minutes to go. And I saw a comment a little bit earlier from Zam about efficiency. And, and you know, it's true that you know, SpaceX has been able to do this much more efficiently. And I think we might talk about this um, in an upcoming wrap-up video. But as we're waiting for the launch here, um, we were covering this commercial crew thing for a local publication called CT Tech Junkie. And uh, we, we were down there, like, when all this was first starting, at, at a number of these launches, when, you know, commercial crew was announced as the, the path forward for launching astronauts. And there was a lot of doubt. Uh, in the community, uh, SpaceX was highly doubted because they hadn't really proven their metal yet. They had, you know, they had sent things into orbit, but they hadn't yet done the space shuttle, the space station deliveries, and everything else. Um, and what's interesting about commercial crew and how NASA designed it is that unlike prior uh, types of government contracting, this is going to get into a little crazy bureaucracy talk, but uh, this is not a cost plus contract. So. This program requires the corporations, the corporation partners that they have, Boeing and SpaceX for commercial crew, they have to have some skin in the game. In exchange for that skin in the game, they can use this hardware for the commercial missions as well. So there's talk of like Tom Cruise going up in one of these dragons to film a movie um, because SpaceX can use this commercially and that's 
what they're going to get for having some, some of their own skin in the game. So NASA has fixed contracts for this. So if you start running your costs too high, it's on you to figure out a way to make it work better. And that, I think, really drove the innovation for SpaceX to get these boosters reused, first of all. That's a big thing. Uh, the Dragon capsules that have been delivering cargo under a separate commercial program for NASA, also a, a, uh, a fixed cost contract, um, those are reusable. So they're even trying to reuse the fairings that separate from some of their satellite launches to be able to reuse that. So they've been really trying to get as much reusability so that their profit margin would go up. And the way this used to work was whatever it cost, you were guaranteed a profit on top of whatever it cost, even if it meant that your cost was more than what you contracted for initially. And that's the big change here for how these commercial crew missions are working and how the commercial cargo missions are working. Um, and I think it's quite remarkable that we're watching astronauts go up in a SpaceX spacecraft first because Boeing was largely anticipated to be the one to be here first. But Boeing's mission was not successful to demonstrate their capsule, and SpaceX had two successful missions. And that is why they're here on the pad today. It's pretty remarkable. I think if you look at government contracting, SpaceX has probably been the most innovative. Or NASA, I'm sorry. NASA's been the most innovative in government for trying to find ways to achieve objectives in a way that's very, that creates real competitive uh, market forces. And it's been a, it's, it's a real success story. And this is not attributable to any one president. This started under the uh, George W. Bush administration. Obama expanded it to crew. Uh, and the Trump administration is continuing it here. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of, this is a bipartisan thing. It's not, you know, one president or another. All right, let me put the audio on here. Our next major event comes at T-minus seven minutes. We begin what we call engine chill. Pre-valves will open. Those currently separate propellants uh, on the first stage from getting down to the Merlin engines will open the pre-valves that allow fuel liquid oxygen to flow to the top of the pumps and more importantly when we open uh, the valves that allow us to begin chilling the nine Merlin 1D turbo pumps on the first stage engine. It'll take a few minutes to get them cold enough. And by the way related to this discussion about contracting and commercial crew um, there is still so you know the space the space shuttle and all the space missions before uh, were using private companies to make the spacecraft, but the government owned all of it. So they bought the space shuttle and the government operated the space shuttle in coordination with their contractors. Um, okay, I'm just listening to their uh, thing there. Um, so now SpaceX owns the spacecraft. It's theirs. It's not, not the government's. But um, NASA is still working on its own spacecraft. So the deal was with this is that the shuttle was so expensive that they couldn't do much beyond go to the space station. And so the commercial crew and cargo missions have brought the price of launching cargo to space down significantly. It's still very expensive, but it's brought the price down a lot. So that's given NASA the ability now to start focusing on deep space missions. And this is where I think you're going to see some real tension develop because the, uh, the NASA rocket is is on track, they're, they're working on it. It's a huge rocket. It's as big as the Saturn V, both in power and, and scale and size. Um, but it's, of course, running into <laughs> overruns and difficulties. And Elon Musk, of course, is working on his own version of a heavy lift rocket. He's got the Falcon Heavy already. Um, he's been making the argument that you don't need all this stuff. You could have me do it, right? Um, NASA doesn't want to probably put all their eggs in one basket, which makes sense. But, you know, you've got to look at this now. So as this heavy lift rocket develops, to some degree, you're seeing SpaceX trying to very rapidly develop their, their heavier rocket. Uh, you're seeing Jeff Bezos' company growing exponentially. You did see that building in the B-roll before of the Blue Origin building. Well, that's, you know, there's a lot of development going on there as well, because I think there's a race now between these traditional aerospace contractors and the traditional government contracting model and this commercial model that's beginning, not there yet, but beginning to prove that it's going to be potentially more of a viable means of doing something that's very expensive for the government to do. So let's turn the audio back on. And stage one fuel is closed out. 
And we got 324 people watching. Right on Not time. quite the uh, million that or so that are watching on NASA, but hey, I'll take it. The first stage, Welcome, everybody. Uh, is complete. Draining back the lines now. So first stage and second stage fuel are complete. Liquid oxygen loading is continuing on both stages. You can see on the view on the left side of the monitor, the condensation, uh, the cold gas wrapped around the stages as the tank skins are chilled by the densified liquid oxygen picking up the humidity Talking from the Florida air. Line. Looks like at this moment we're a little more than 90% full on the oxidizer on the first stage, ticking up towards that 80% mark on the second stage. We'll be counting down all the way to so about two or three minutes. They basically minutes, put the gas in five minutes before it takes off. Everything is loaded and heaters closing out. And the reason is, is that you're putting in highly chilled liquid oxygen into the into the spaceship here. That's the oxidizer. Dragon has and transition to it, um, the terminal count. It evaporates, as you can see, very quickly. So Vehicle you have to keep replenishing. So you really just want to get it loaded in and, and do it quick, to, closer to the launch. And it's also probably not a good thing to have a lot of high-pressured explosive liquid oxygen uh, in the spacecraft for a long Falcon period of time tanks. when you We're have crew inside of it. Around the second stage. It's all about safety, and too. Begin to I retract the I'm not a rocket back. scientist, but... Again, I did play with SD's model rocket. We'll move back did. about two degrees. All right, get so us to the lift off position. At um, lift and it's off. funny, I'm looking on the, the comments here. First of all, a lot of nice comments from some folks exactly. here. Uh, so Alexander Vasquez, a new subscriber, welcome. Um, Eric M says that two, my stream please. is a minute earlier Launch than his local news channel. And, you know, it's really, I guess, whatever CDN you pick this off of, off of right? So, in reality, as I sit right now, we're two minutes away from launch. But uh, you're seeing it at about four minutes and change. <laughs> so, you know, we'll all just watch it together. It'll be live for somebody. <laughs> so by the time, you, it's kind of like a light, from like, lift off. like the speed of light. Again, at this moment, Bob and Doug are really just laser focused on those displays. This is exciting, though. This is the first time we've launched Americans they have insight uh, to orbit directly since into Dragon in the Falcon American 9. Soil. They're able to see where their fuel loading is at, how everything's and progressing down cost, with the count. Um, final SpaceX started. is much less expensive than the Russians are. Three and a half minutes from launch. And the Strongback is now reclining away from the Falcon 9. All right, so we're getting there. Mallory says it's more fun to watch with everyone here. It's very exciting. Absolutely. It'd be kind of cool it'd be to rent out a theater and just watch this all with a bunch of people. Wouldn't that be fun? We should do that. I'll fly you all in. The weather looks and perfect, and you'll start to see some of these, uh, hopefully, pieces of equipment retract. I'll go bleed. Two minutes, or three minutes. Dragon has transitioned to terminal count and is on internal power. And that's Stage one, locks load, close out. Power now. I was at one of these launches, okay, and they got T to T zero. They lighted the, the engines up, Stage one, but the load computer is shut it down out. right before Stage they released two, the we'll plants. Continue to load for about another and half a minute or so. <laughs> that was a real bummer. Once we get the completion of stage two LOX loading, we have to vent down the line, so you'll see another large white cloud coming off of the strong back. That'll be normal. That'll happen around transitioning to T minus power. one minute and forty and all seconds. That We're going on internal power normal. now seconds away from the stage two locks load being complete it's been almost nine years since we've been in this position a lot of work done by thousands of people to get to this point all our eyes focused on two now stage two Thanks locks load is closed out propellant fills are complete I'm not sure what all that water was on the pad there. So they do put a lot of water Stage out on the pad. Locks load complete. All fuel, all oxidizer on Falcon 9. One minute, 34 seconds to go till launch. Ground gas closeouts is starting. These guys have to be excited. This has been a long time for these astronauts to wait for this opportunity. Now, if we were, like, with a satellite feed, we would be watching, we would know what's going on right now. <laughs> so we're about a minute, we're about a minute and 20 seconds behind reality here. So, nonetheless, I'm going to watch this.
And what we will do, though, is I'm going to take a look at my Twitter Falcon feed. Falcon 9 is in startup. Dragon is in countdown. FTS is armed for launch. All right, here we go. Under a minute now, the FTS, the flight termination system, has been armed. I can't even imagine. I mean, granted, you train for this. Dragon, very... SpaceX, go for launch. Very trained to this SpaceX, moment. Dragon, or go for launch. Let's light this candle. All right, there we go. T minus 30 seconds. Now they've trained for all this, but they haven't felt the G-forces of this machine just yet. But they felt it on the shuttle. Stage one tanks pressing for flight. T minus 15 seconds. There we go, everybody. 10, 10 9, 9, 9, 8, 8 7, 7. Six. Six. You see the water Five, going there? That's going to four, dampen down the vibration three, from launch. Two, one, zero. Ignition. Lift off. There we go. The Falcon 9 and Crew Dragon. What a Gangasa. shot. That is an awesome Good shot. Godspeed, bottom dog. America has launched. So rises I have been waiting for this for a long time. The ambitions of a new generation continuing the dream. Let's just watch. 20 seconds into flight, stage one propulsion is nominal. T plus 30 seconds into this historic mission. Flying crew on board Dragon and Falcon 9, and look at them go. Falcon power telemetry nominal. M1D throttle down. We're throttling down to get ready for the period of maximum dynamic pressure. We're in the throttle bucket. So this is where the atmosphere has the greatest effect on the spacecraft. So you want to throttle the engines down so that you don't overdo it, and then you can. Vehicle is supersonic. We've exceeded Mach 1 on the Falcon 9. M1D throttle up. We're throttling back up to full power as we're through Max Q. Copy one Bravo. And we heard that one Bravo call out. That's just the second abort zone that they're in. They'll continue to be on this until the first stage has done its job and they switch over to the second. At this point, Bob and Doug pulling about 2.3 Gs, 2.3 times the Earth's gravity, already moving at over 1,500 miles per hour. We've heard the call out for MVAC engine chill. That's getting the MVAC engine ready to light. That'll come at about 2.44 into flight. Right now, everything continuing to look good. Next major event coming up is going to be the triple. We'll have main engine cutoff of the nine first stage engines, stage separation, and then ignition of the second stage engine to continue to carry astronauts into orbit. Coming up in about 20 seconds. M M1D throttle down. We heard we're throttling down the Merlin engines on the first stage. And we have Miko. Miko. Two Alpha. Falcon stage separation confirmed. Falcon two Alpha. M back ignition. All right, we have stage separation confirmed. The first stage beginning its flight back. The second stage being powered by that single Merlin 1D vacuum engine has ignited and is now carrying Bob and Doug into orbit. So they're going to continue under the power of this second stage. Stage two propulsion is nominal which will cut off at SECO, or second engine cut off, at about 8 minutes and 44 seconds into today's flight. So a little over 5 minutes to go still on this second stage. You heard the call out to Alpha, so they're now in the longest abort zone that carries them all the way from about North Carolina up the eastern seaboard almost to Canada. Things looking good, though, getting good call outs, nominal propul pul propulsion on that second stage. Bob and Doug continuing to make their way into orbit. Dragon SpaceX nominal trajectory. 
Acquisition of signal in Bermuda. SpaceX Dragon nominal trajectory. All right, here in nominal trajectories, the Dragon pointed in the right direction, continuing to make their flight uphill. Heard acquisition of signal Bermuda. That's one of the other ground stations that they're using to get telemetry and data back from this spacecraft. Stage two propulsion is still nominal. little over four minutes, 40 seconds into the flight. Bob and Doug flying at more than 5,600 miles Dragon per SpaceX hour. Dragon SpaceX nominal trajectory. Already almost 200 miles downrange from the Kennedy Space Center. Nominal trajectory continuing. While they continue uphill, looks like we are getting a view of the first stage as well. Yep, on your right screen, you can see that first stage with the grid fins deployed. It's making its way back to attempt to land on our drone ship. Of course, I still love you today. And we're just about a minute, uh, a couple minutes away from the entry burn, and that's where three of the nine Merlin engines do ignite to help slow the vehicle down as it re enters back into the Earth's atmosphere. And then after the entry burn will be the landing burn, which is just a single engine Dragon burn. SpaceX nominal trajectory. And you heard nominal starting chill for entry burn. There's that call out. They are still on a nominal trajectory on Dragon, still on second stage, and that's that M back engine on second stage on your left screen. Again, on your right screen is that first stage booster coming back towards our drone ship. Of course, I still love you. We're about a minute away from entry burn. Meanwhile, that second stage continuing to power Dragon into orbit. Again, if you're keeping an eye on that timer, that's going to continue to burn until 8 minutes and 44 seconds into flight. So a little over two minutes from now, we'll hear the call out Seco. It'll then be a little stage under, two propulsion a little is still over. good. A little over three minutes until Dragon physically separates from the second stage of the Falcon 9 after the upper Dragon stage gets SpaceX, a chance. Dragon nominal trajectory. Dragon copies, nominal trajectory. Continuing to check in with Bob and Doug as they are on a nominal trajectory. Just about 10 seconds away from that first stage, starting that entry burn on your right screen. We should be able to see that view live. Stage one entry burn startup. And there is that entry burn Acquisition beginning. Burn. This burn lasts about 36 seconds long. Stage two FTS is saved. That entry burn continues. We're just about a minute away from Seco. We'll have a number of events all happen. Okay, my mic should be in back. Rapid succession. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. Uh, it'll Talking be the shutdown. second engine cut off. Stage one we'll be looking for down. that uh, stage one landing burn shortly after. So my, my mic should be back should now. My, I had accidentally unplugged the, the battery for my wireless receiver the other day, and it finally cool died. View on your left Shows you how good the battery life is on these mics. All right, so now we're watching that first stage come back. That they are seeing right now themselves. Terminal guidance. I'm back there all up. And thank you, Zam, for the super chat. Much appreciated. We are coming up 25 seconds or so away from Seco, or second engine cutoff. You can see it's getting a little bit of weather there the on the way down. Bob and Doug are experiencing their highest G-force. We're seeing the counter tick up to right about 1.8. Copy, Shannon. You heard Shannon, so that just means they're in their final abort zones. If they were to abort at this point, would either be an abort to orbit or to land off the coast of Ireland. Standing by for second one cutoff confirmation. Back, step. 
And back shut yeah. down. Stage one landing winner. Confirmation of Seco's second engine cutoff. Now we are waiting for our so it looks first like stage to make its way to our They are probably in orbit now. Of course, I still Here comes the drone ship landing. We don't usually see these happen live because the camera gets knocked oh, around so much. And uh, you'll see that you'll see the camera start shaking, and it'll probably go out right before it hits the barge. And then usually it comes back on, and the rocket's there. Yeah. <laughs> it's looking a bit stormy out there. We'll wait for confirmation of that landing shortly here. Oh, there it is. <laughs> and there you can see on your screen, Falcon 9 has landed. This is the first Falcon 9 to carry humans to orbit, so very exciting for us. And as you can see on your right screen, Bob and Doug are still making their way to their targeted orbit. Have one need recovery one. So exciting today. <laughs> it doesn't stop. It does not stop. All right, we did, we did hear now. again that call out good orbital insertion. So that means Falcon 9 and Dragon right now exactly where they're supposed to be. Can we need a FRC on recovery one? And it's right at about 12 minutes when Can Dragon will separate. There you go. You can see the, uh, the little so Dragon guy saw floating zero around. G indicator floating around there. I know Bob and Doug owe us. A little bit about what exactly that is that they brought up with them. <laughs> and before separation, before Dragon initiates separation from the second stage, they do make sure to make they, they do ensure that the vehicle is not spinning and it is in good con condition before we. So where we're at right now is a couple things. First of all, we got them up and they're in orbit, so that is a good thing. That's that's the first step is to get them into orbit. Um, what they're doing now is uh, you'll see that second stage engine is still on camera because it hasn't separated. So what you're going to see um, in about four or five minutes, and we'll stick around until they get to that point. Um, they're going to detach that second stage. Now, the second stage is the one thing SpaceX is not able to recover and reuse. So that's going to go, uh, most of it will burn up in the atmosphere, and a lot of it will end up just uh, landing in the ocean somewhere. And there's a, there's a lot of rocket parts in the ocean. Um, what you're seeing on the left is the Mission Control in Hawthorne, California, where SpaceX is headquartered. And a little bit of trivia, they have a tunnel that goes from SpaceX to Tesla, so Elon Musk can get around traffic. They've got like a mile-long tunnel underground in L.A. so he can go back and forth between his facilities. And I'm guessing his employees can access that as well. Um, if you uh, watch um, Jay Leno's Garage, they have a... Uh, they have a, a video of them taking the cyber truck. All right, so now we're just waiting for that second stage deployment. It looks like it's coming up next year. Let's listen in. Waiting for confirmation now of that. Dragon up. separation confirmed. Dragon separation confirmed. <laughs> there is a great view right in front of you Compound of Dragon separating. Separation confirmed. And there's that call out. The Dragon, Dragon is what is, is moving away from the second stage, which is where that camera is located. Station today. Dragon SpaceX, with that separation call, uh, we have a few words for you from our Falcon 19. Standing by. Dragon, Chief Engineer on Dragon to Ground. Bob Doug, on behalf of the entire launch team, thanks for flying with Falcon 9 today. We hope you enjoyed the ride and. Wish you a great mission. Thanks, Bala. Congratulations to you and the F9 team for the first uh, human ride for Falcon 9. And it was incredible. Uh, appreciate all the hard work and uh, thanks for the great uh, ride to space. Copy all. Bala, I'd like to be proud of you guys and the rest of the team. Uh, Thank you so much for what you've uh, done for us today, putting America back into low Earth orbit up from the Florida coast. Got the all. Good luck. Godspeed. All right, so Bob and Doug are in and Dragon space. Dragon SpaceX, we confirm nominal equals activation and service section Draco checkouts. Uh, nose cone deploys in progress. Gapiel, we're monitoring. The core here in Hawthorne giving the crew a heads up. 
that we have confirmation the nose cone is deploying. So again, that nose cone is going to open up a little bit more than 90 degrees, goes up to about, I think, 105 degrees, and that's going to expose uh, the actual docking ring and the hatch that they're going to be going through once they attach to the International Space Station. And also four of those Draco thrusters, we call them the forward bulkhead thrusters, they're going to be used for these major phase burns or firings of those thrusters to actually raise their orbit gradually over the coming hours. Also heard good activation of the ECLIS, that's the Environmental Control and Life Support System. That's everything controlling their atmosphere, uh, just keeping Dragon a nice, safe, habitable environment where they're going to be living for the next 19 hours until they arrive at the space station. Right, exactly. And Falcon 9's job may be done for today, but the mission is not over. Crew Dragon's job is not done. As you can see, Bob and Doug are still inside Crew Dragon making their way. It will be a 19-hour trip to the International Space Station before they dock tomorrow morning. And Pretty such exciting cool stuff. Views. I love that we can get these live views here and see and watch what they're doing now that they are in orbit. Yeah, it's, it's incredible to just be looking over their shoulder to be along for the ride. And we're going to be with them, and we're going to be with all of you the entire way uh, for their journey to the space station. We're going to be covering live. So there was a question about um, from uh, Dadu, how do you go to the bathroom? Well, they have a toilet on there, apparently. And the, me the media has been trying to get more information about this toilet because apparently it's some new technology that they've employed with it. Uh, there is actually a pretty funny video on YouTube, if you look for it, of uh, Mike Mas Massimino, who's an astronaut and another astronaut, go and look at the train. They have actually a training air portion for astronaut space station training where you have to learn how to use the toilet uh, because it's not as straightforward as it is on Earth for a variety of reasons. Um, what a great shot that is, huh? So what I thought I would do before I close out here is just show you a few other things. Um, because uh, as I mentioned, I've been to a lot of these launches. In fact, I was doing some of the space coverage before I started getting into the uh, tech stuff. And uh, I thought maybe I'd show you a couple of things that, that we took. Um, so let me give you a, a look here at uh, this video. So um, this is the first launch of astronauts uh, from the United States uh, since uh, 2011, July of 2011. And that was the launch of Space Shuttle Atlantis, which was the last time Americans launched from Florida uh, into orbit. And I was there. And check it out. Here is some video of that. I'll get you some audio here, too. And you're hearing actually voices of um, uh, who were there with me on, on scene. But listen to this. So that was a, we mixed in some NASA shots with that. But what's amazing is that um, you don't hear the sound of the shuttle or any of these rockets until about 24 seconds uh, after they lift off, um, which is crazy because it takes that, that length of time for the sound to travel over to where you are. Uh, and then we also got to go, I'm going to turn the audio down on this one because it's super loud. Uh, we also got to go to the last landing. So uh, right towards the end of the shuttle program, there was a lot of media opportunities to check out a lot of cool stuff at the Space Center. Um, and so one of those opportunities was to obviously go and see a landing. Uh, and I had some friends with me, uh, Matt Reese, who I don't believe is uh, on the uh, chat right now, but we're, we'll try to get him in at some point in the future. Um, he was able to acquire a FLIR camera 
And suddenly, our little tiny outlet became very valuable to the rest of the media because the space shuttle was coming in at like, you know, it must have been like 5 o'clock in the morning. We had, we, we had like maybe an hour of sleep after arriving in Florida. To, we had enough time to go to the hotel and, and drop our stuff off and grab the Waffle House to go. <laughs> and then uh, we went uh, right down there. And we had a FLIR camera. And because it was dark out, you can't see the shuttle coming in. Uh, because they, they turn off the lights so they don't blind the shuttle pilot who's actually flying the shuttle into the, the runway. So we had a FLIR camera and we could uh, see it coming in. Not, not a high frame rate on the camera. This was July 21st, 2011, and, and Doug Hurley, one of the astronauts who's up there right now, was uh, on the shuttle. So we have a couple different views of this. So that's the FLIR image. And I'm going to pause it right here because that um, van was blocking another vehicle where the astronauts' families were watching from. So they were, been, they were very careful about making sure the families had privacy. And then here it is uh, from our other cameras. Isn't that amazing? And that's what it looked like. We were that close to it. It was crazy. And it would, uh, it landed at about um, twice the speed of a 747, super fast. So that was pretty crazy. And then uh, we, we were then driven back to the uh, press center. And then they uh, brought us all back out again to watch this, which was the towback. So after it landed, um, a few of the larger outlets, let me turn the audio off on this one. A few of the uh, larger outlets got to go to the runway itself and we were able to go to the taxiway here. And all of these folks who were walking beside the shuttle were everyone who had worked and supported the shuttle uh, over the years. And um, most, I think a good number of these people lost their jobs after this, uh, the shuttle was rolled back. And it was kind of bizarre because they um, invited us to this cookout at the vehicle assembly building outside. And there was you know, probably over a thousand or so people there, maybe more than that. And we learned as we were mingling with the crowd there that most of the people there, again, almost a thousand of them, if not more, uh, were all not going to have jobs the next day, which was pretty, pretty, pretty sad. You know, a lot of skill, a lot of skill set that was lost uh, with that. Um, but uh, you know, now it's coming back, so that's that's a exciting thing. I think I've got one more I can show you real quick. Um, actually, you know what? I think it's on my other computer here. Um, we went, actually, let me show you this first one and then I can show you a few others. So we also got to, let me get another image, I'll put my image up back up on screen here. Um, we got to go, I'm just adding a video to my, my list here. Uh, we got to go on a tour of Space Shuttle Discovery um, before it was decommissioned or in the process of being decommissioned. So let me show you this real quick and we'll put some audio on in this one and you can have a, have a listen. Uh, my name is Charles Bell, and we are on the mid-deck of Discovery. Well, this room we're in right now is about the size of a small bedroom. Um, once it's packed for flight, you probably have uh, 35 to 40 percent of the room that you see right now. But bear in mind that although we're confined to the floor space, they have the entire volume to work with. Yeah. So what's interesting, what he was saying there, is that you know, you're, you're in what is essentially a small bedroom for seven people. Um, but on the ground, you have the floor, the walls, and the ceiling. But in orbit, there is no up or down. So you can make use of all the surfaces. So you would have people sleeping on the ceiling, on the walls, on the floor. Um, and there was a bathroom in there. They had taken it yeah, out already, so we didn't get to see wall. that. You also have another locker next to it. In this picture, you can see the galley. Normally, we carry two spacesuits, and they're normally stowed in the airlock, which is back in that way. We would only use this airlock when we're um, performing a mission such as Hubble uh, servicing. Uh, normally, when we dock with space station, we use the uh, uh, airlock on space station. And then this ladder would not be there when they were in flight. This is the flight deck. Uh, flight deck of Discovery. OV-103, uh, commander seat, pilot seat, uh, forward flight station, and back here is the aft flight station, right back here. I started, let's see, I was out here, TDY, and uh, second flight, 
that's when I first started working on this, this one. Right. But over the years, I've worked on all of them. Okay. It's been used, but it's a um, uh, national treasure. Uh, what you're looking at now is the Palo Bay of Discovery. We're currently preparing it for a trip to Washington, D.C., where it'll be permanently displayed. Mid-body 60 feet long, 15 feet wide. We have three fuel cells, cost between $12.3 million each, so we handle them pretty gently. But for the last 15, 20 years, no issues at all with fuel cells. I think we worked all the kinks out of it. We could go another 20 years if they'd let us. That was uh, kind of a neat experience to be able to see that. And the, uh, a lot of the space shuttle um, had Connecticut connections, so uh, all of the spacesuits were designed in uh, Connecticut. Uh, actually at a facility right next to the airport, uh, the Bradley International Airport. So as the astronauts are out on spacewalks, they're actually being monitored from, uh, from Connecticut, which was interesting. Um, and then the uh, fuel cells, why I asked them about the fuel cells in that piece, uh, the fuel cells were made in Connecticut also. And we actually went to the, uh, the, the facility where they made the fuel cells, and they were of course doing, hey, there's William Shatner up on there. Uh, they were doing uh, uh, fuel cells for commercial power. Uh, and it was getting harder for them to continue fixing and repairing the shuttle fuel cells because they were really 1960s, 1970s technology. Uh, just to give you an idea as to how hard it was to keep maintaining those shuttles. So that was really uh, a challenging thing for that. So, um, yeah, so uh, it, was, um, it was a fun, this was cool. So where, where we're at now with this is that uh, they, they're going to be doing a lot of tests in orbit. And if everything goes right, uh, the astronauts that you just saw launch might not come back for three or four months. They may spend a, uh, some extra time up there on the station um, because part of what they want to see is how well the spacecraft performs when it's docked and idle on the station because part of the mission uh, here is that when you send astronauts up, they typically come back down in the same spacecraft they came up in. And with the Russian Soyuz uh, spacecrafts, uh, they have an expiration date. They can't stay up forever. Uh, and they're also the escape pods. So God forbid anything happens on the station, you've got to get off. So those spacecraft have to be able to sit docked and idle, but come on and take them away quickly if there's an, if there's an issue. Uh, so they're probably going to leave it up there for a few months, and they'll, they'll be up there for a while. But they could come back tomorrow if there's a problem, or maybe next week. So who knows, you know, so we'll see what, uh, how long they're going to be up there for. But this is a really in interesting mission. And this is called uh, Crew Demo 2 because this is still a test demonstration flight. Uh, but the next flight on SpaceX's uh, hardware will be called Crew 1. And there will be some milestones coming up soon because Boeing, even though they're not first, they still have, uh, you know, some skin in this game. So they're going to be working on their Starliner craft. But the, uh, the government's um, analysis shows that the SpaceX system is a lot less expensive to operate. So they're going to have to work on bringing costs down if they want to get more, more launches. And the key difference is that the Boeing hardware uh, uses a disposable rocket. So the SpaceX hardware is on a reusable rocket, although NASA, I think, wanted a new rocket for this one. So we'll have to see what, uh, what they end up doing there. All right. Well, this was fun, everybody, huh? So, uh, you know, stay tuned to the, the NASA uh, website and to the NASA uh, YouTube channel. And the reason I suggest you do that is because they're going to be uh, doing a lot in orbit uh, for the next 19 hours before they dock. And then at the docking period, that's going to be very exciting also, because uh, typically with the SpaceX cargo craft, uh, they don't dock the cargo craft to the station. They, they get it close and they grab it with an, a robotic arm and, and berth it. Um, so the SpaceX uh, capsule is actually going to dock itself to the station. And I don't think they're docking manually. I think they are going to do some manual flight controls, though, to make sure those work correctly on the way over. Um, so that's going to be something exciting to, uh, to keep an eye on. So yeah, this is, uh, this is good stuff. I am excited about this. And I, I think it's important that uh, you know, for the United States to get its launch capacity back. Um, this was a very long process. Uh, I think it probably went longer than they wanted it to, but you have to do it safely. And I think SpaceX has demonstrated that they can uh, build rockets that can be reliable and can get uh, crew into space safely. So we'll have to just keep an eye on things and see, uh, see where it goes, but it's uh, certainly pretty exciting stuff. 
Um, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited for, uh, for our space program. This is, uh, this is, like I said, this has been going on for about 10 years that they've been trying to get this going. And I'll, I'll leave you with one thing. I, I did an article uh, on my CT News Junkie site. I'll, I'll put a link somewhere um, in a little bit. Uh, that um, you know, we went down there right when this was all starting. So we were th down there for the last, I think it was the second to last launch. And SpaceX had been public, but not, they hadn't been as, as public as they are now. They were kind of operating in a more stealthy, more stealthier capacity. And they opened up the facility to the media. Here, let me show you the, this uh, thing real quick here. Um, so they, they, let, they, they put us all in a bus and they brought us all over because we were all down there for, the, for the, the space shuttle launch. And they brought us right into their, their, their hangar at the Cape Canaveral Air Station. Isn't this cool? Um, so this one, this rocket, this booster was the first booster that, that got the spacecraft to the space station. I'm pretty sure this is the one that, that they launched there. Um, and what was remarkable to me was just like how, like you had these kids sitting at a, at a table, right? I mean, they're, look how young they are, right? And this was SpaceX, and this is SpaceX. They're young and they're, they're hungry, they're getting stuff done, and this was testing and getting things going. Uh, right here is um, a device that they use to spin the rocket on, uh, you know, to, to get at different components so they don't have to go vertical. And the Russians do something similar with theirs. And then uh, somebody asked the SpaceX guy, hey, can we go under the, the rocket? And he's like, yeah, sure. And of course, everyone bolted. And uh, then they reminded us, don't touch the space hardware. I did touch it, though. Um, let me fix this, this real quick so I can show you what we're looking at here. Um, because this is kind of neat. So this is inside. This is not my picture. This is a SpaceX picture. Um, but this is inside that hangar that you saw next to the launch pad that they just launched from. And so this is the, the spacecraft we just saw launch right here in the middle. And then these two are, or these three are used boosters. Isn't that cool? So they, when they recover them, they bring them back in here to get them refurbished and they can fit, it looks like four of them in here at the same time. But they, you know, if they have too many come back, they got a problem, right? It's, uh, it's kind of kind of neat. Uh, that's what we just saw before and that's uh, the slide I showed you earlier. I think that's all I had to show you. Oh, so this was another thing I wanted to show you too because uh, you know, for the weather, because there's been a lot of talk of the weather. So this was the, the last launch. So all we saw at the last launch from the press site was that. <laughs> like it went up into the clouds, and then you didn't see it anymore. So if you got a break in the weather, they take it, and that's what they did that day. So the, the last launch of the shuttle, at least for us on the ground, we didn't, uh, we didn't see all that much there. It was pretty, uh, it's pretty funny. All right. <laughs> Yeah, so Imre uh, puts on a funny thing here. So what, what, uh, thank you for the super chat, by the way. So what happens is, for whatever reason, I don't, and I think they're serious, whenever you do one of these live streams, you get all the, the flat earth people coming in and they, they just troll constantly. So I will not say the earth is flat, but I do appreciate the super chat because we, we all know it ain't flat. Um, but uh, yeah, this was, this was good stuff. So now, that, here's, so here's the next space race um, because Remember, we've got, uh, here, let me show you the, 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 uh, the other thing I wanted to show you here. Let me go pull it up again. Um, where did I put this? So I have some B-roll footage of, I think this is it. Yeah. So the next space race is, is going to be a multi-stage affair because here's what you got. You have SpaceX, the upstart. You have Boeing. Okay, who's the incumbent company that's been doing these things forever. And then you've got Blue Origin. This is their facility. Let me just turn the audio off here. This is their facility in, um, in Cape Canaveral. And that's just one of their facilities because they also have some stuff out in the desert for doing launch testing and stuff. Uh, they are owned by Amazon. Uh, well, not by Amazon, but by Jeff Bezos, who owns Amazon. I mean, they're not messing around. Look at the size of this building. I mean, it's like, you know, they're, they're designing rockets in here. So they are trying to develop um, systems that are in line with what SpaceX is offering because the market now is getting less expensive. And so you need reusability. You need to have something that can be turned around quickly. And that's what the Bezos folks are working on at Blue Origin. So you've got that, you've got SpaceX. Then you've got the government side of things because in other parts of the world, up until very recently, uh, the governments were running all the space programs. In fact, for a while, um, when the space shuttle was first introduced, 
um, there was a law that required um, anything commercially being launched to go through or go up on the space shuttle. Like you couldn't make your own rocket and go up. And that was during the Reagan era. You wouldn't expect that, but that was the, that was the law of the land. But what happened uh, was that foreign launch providers got cheaper. So uh, Europe and China and Russia, they all were you know, really getting competitive on rocket launch prices. And at the time SpaceX formed, and we did a, a big story on this, at the time SpaceX formed, uh, the US launch market uh, was, was, if it wasn't a government vehicle which was mandated to go on, uh, or government satellite that was mandated to go on a, on a uh, U.S. rocket, um, there, was no, uh, there was no business. There was no private entity launching satellites on American rockets. And that's the one thing that SpaceX brought back to U.S. soil because when SpaceX started up, uh, they were offering prices lower, lower than the lowest priced offerings that the Chinese were currently offering. So it's gotten extremely competitive. So you've got these private companies competing against government, I think you're going to see in the next five years a significant push to commercialize exploration because that's why Elon's doing Starship. It's to launch a commercial service, but it's to offer that to the government as well. Um, you're going to see the government trying to design its own rocket, which they're doing, and that's the race right now. And that's why SpaceX is so aggressive on Starship. You're going to see the Blue Origin uh, rockets begin to be more publicly known. Uh, that's happening. And then you've got these little startups doing some really unique things. There's a, a company called, uh, I think they're Electron. Or that's the name of the rocket is Electron. Um, gosh, I can't, I, I can't remember the name off the top of my head all of a sudden. Um, it, it escapes me. But there's a company with a rocket called Electron. Maybe one of you in the chat can remind me. Uh, and they're doing uh, micro satellites into orbit, like those little bread box size satellites. Huge industry for that. And those electron rockets are a lot cheaper than a Falcon 9 or anything else that's out there. So there's a big push over on that front. Uh, they launched those electron rockets from New Zealand right now, but they're also moving into uh, Virginia to do some launches. Um, you have uh, Sierra Nevada uh, doing some cargo launches to the space station, and they've got a little mini space shuttle that they're going to be rolling out for additional cargo launches. So there's a lot of different launch technologies out there, and a lot of it's centered around the U.S. space market. And so this is going to put a lot of pressure everywhere. It's going to be really interesting to see what happens. And Rocket Lab, thank you, uh, um, Aiden, for that reminder. Um, so it's going to be a really exciting time if you've been into space. Because when I was a kid, we were told there was going to be a passenger space shuttle like before you know it. And of course, that didn't happen. So I've been waiting for my ticket. So I think uh, a lot of us are going to have the opportunity, if we want to, uh, to go into space at some point. And, you know, the cost right now is probably in the tens of millions. I think in the next five years it'll be into the single millions and then it'll go down from there. So that's where we're going. Okay. Well, I am going to, this was great, first of all. Um, let's uh, keep those astronauts, uh, they're doing fine. Let's keep them in our thoughts because they're, they've got a, a, a lot of stuff that's going to happen in the next 20, 19, 18 hours. Um, but the good news is they are safely on orbit. And they're on their way to the space station, the first time that Americans have launched from U.S. soil uh, since 2011. And that's a big deal. And uh, unfortunately, we couldn't get down there to cover it in person. But the good news is uh, we had about 400 or so watching today. It was great to have you all with me. Uh, I want to thank some uh, super chatters here, including Alexander Vasquez, Zam, and Imre. Uh, and uh, yeah, let me take a couple more questions here. Uh, Nick F. says, yeah, it won't, be a, it won't be a matter of time until we buy a... Uh, ticket on Amazon, a space ticket. I, I'll buy a space ticket on Amazon for sure. Um, Londog wants to know, where is the engineering talent? Uh, right now, probably with SpaceX. I think there's, um, that's a good question, because I think there's, there's a lot of talent that got dispersed after uh, the shuttle program ended. But what you're getting, too, is a lot of young talent that's getting exposed to SpaceX and other aerospace companies through internships and other, you know, current you know, graduate and, and undergraduate internship opportunities and stuff. So um, I think there's a growing market for younger graduates. And that's going to be really exciting. And a lot of it is not just all the mechanical and aerospace engineering, but there's a lot of uh, computational stuff, you know, for autonomy and, 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 and the like that is going into that. So it's, uh, it's pretty good. Ed Horn says, we'll have to donate to get the lawn into orbit super chat. Yeah, that one would be good. So we'll set up a couple of tiers. 
Um, the first tier, so like my, my entry level tier for the channel membership is a dollar, um, but for the put me into orbit one, um, we're going to need about a million to start. And remember, YouTube been, you know, and Patreon, they'll take a cut, so maybe a million five just to get it an even million. And then I'll need about, you know, 15 or 20 of you to do that. And then like the gold level one, we're looking at about 20 million. That'll, that'll pay for about half of it. So um, that'll, be, uh, that'll be good stuff. But uh, yeah, this was fun. I'm glad you all enjoyed it. This is, you know, it, it, it's funny because I kind of started doing this kind of content before I got in, into the consumer tech stuff heavily. And it's fun to see the, the growth in channels um, out there that are covering space. Because when I did it, I couldn't get an audience built. You know, it just wasn't the interest level there. Now there is. Um, so the, the everyday astronaut, I met him at, um, at one of the last launches I went to. Um, it was fun talking to him just to compare notes on, on channels and growth and that sort of thing. And he's, he's cool. He drives himself down there from, I think, from like the Midwest. Um, he's got a Tesla, of course, now. He drives himself down there and covers these launches. And he does live stuff, live things and everything. And uh, it, was, uh, it was pretty cool to talk to him. By the way, the last shuttle launch, there was a lot of celebrity, uh, you know, celebrity journalists and, and other folks. I got to chat with uh, John Oliver uh, from The John Oliver Show. And we actually have a friend in common. Uh, somebody I went to high school with was a writer on The Daily Show, so we were talking about him and, and having, a, having a laugh together. So it was pretty, pretty cool to connect with folks there. But yeah, it's all, sor all sorts of cool people. A friend of mine uh, got to know Bill Nye, the science guy, you know. So like, there, you'll see a lot of these folks at these, uh, at these launches. So it's, it's really, really cool. Well, I'm glad you all enjoyed this. Um, oh, so how many see? Roble68 says, how much would you pay to go to space? I think it would depend on like what I would be able to see. So, and this is not to say that I would have this available at a moment's notice, but like I, I would probably, I would say if I knew, it, first of all, I have to be safe. Like, like we'd have to see a few more of these launches, but let's say like Elon Musk said to me, hey, we can take you up, or maybe Jeff Bezos will say to me, we can take you up, but it's gonna cost X. I would say like, 25 or 30 grand would be my number. And I want to be up, I want to be able to do at least a couple of orbits before I came back down. Because I don't want to just go up and come back down again. I got to have some orbit going on. So I want to be up there, you know, earn my, earn my wings. So that, that, I think that's probably where, but then if it was that, if it was 25 or 30 grand, everybody would be doing it, right? So, but I wouldn't spend a million bucks. If I had a, if I had a million bucks burning a hole in my pocket, I would buy a, I'd buy a plane. I think I could get more use out of that. <laughs> um, so Londog says, would you run my entire computer setup and everything I do from a touch screen? That's where the Dragon ship seems to be running on. Yeah, I, I think they've got some buttons on there too, but I, you know, if, it, if the, the cabins, I don't think the cabin vibrates that much. So I, I think as long as you don't have a lot of vibration, you can probably do it. And the one thing about a spaceship is that you're not looking out the window to fly it because it's going too fast. So you're just hitting, you know, buttons on there and stuff. So, uh, so Imre says, would I go alone and not with my family? That's a good question. I don't know. I think my, my youngest daughter, or my oldest daughter, is not that, this is what kills me. My kids are not into space like that is. That's, that's what's killing me. So my oldest, no way. I like being on Earth. I don't want to live on the moon. Like, she's not into that. So that's cool. So the younger one, I haven't, I haven't figured out if she's up for it yet. My wife would be happy just to send me away, right? <laughs> no, she, she, she would probably want to come with me. Um, so uh, cool. And uh, David Bound is watching on uh, his old stock projector. Cool. That's neat. So Rich Wilson says you can get it. Yeah, you can get a used Cessna pretty cheap. You know what the, the cost is, is the avionics to getting, you know, getting the autopilot and all the other stuff. And actually, that's been one thing I've been toying with is I've been watching all these aviation channels on, on YouTube. And I've had some, I've had the, the pleasure of experiencing traveling in, in, in civil aviation as a, as a passenger. Uh, and I'll tell you what, flying into these little airports is so much better. <laughs> so um, I would love to learn how to fly a plane. That's by, it's on my list. And, and to some degree, this pandemic has accelerated my desire to do that. Because um, I, I, wanted, I, want some, I want something now to get me out of the house a little more often. And I think that might be a fun thing to do. Um, John Walshaw says, would the Sinclair ZX81 behind you be helpful on a trip to space? I bet you it's probably got more computing power than the Apollo computer did, right? It's a Z80. You could probably uh, do something there. 
Yeah, Long Dead 6 has very few buttons on that, that dragon. Um, hey, Khan is here from Berlin. Uh, and he's wondering if Virgin Galactic is still in the commercial spaceflight business. So first of all, Khan is um, somebody who uh, showed me around Berlin when I was in Germany back in September, back when we could go places and see people. Um, so uh, Virgin Galactic is, in fact, they are not, so what they've got is a suborbital uh, pl uh, space plane that will launch from a, an, so it's an airplane that takes you up and then they drop you and then you fly off in this rocket plane. And so uh, it doesn't go into orbit, it's like suborbital, so it gets you into space. So you're technically in space, you'll be weightless as you, as you, uh, whatever. Um, and then on the way down, you'll feel some weightlessness and then you land like an airplane. So that's what they're doing. Um, but they are doing some commercial launches of satellites from like a, um, like a rocket that they launch off of, a, off of a more traditional looking jet. So they're still in the game. Um, so we'll have to see what he does there. And uh, so Martin and Lawn Dog said, I got to get into some flight simulator issues. So Martin says, flying is awesome. It totally is awesome. I've had a, I've been, I've been flying up front on a couple of uh, flights lately, and it's been, it's kind of, it's really fun. I've been playing, and, and then Lawn Dog is talking about the new Microsoft Flight Simulator. I'm very excited about that. And I have been playing with, with the Microsoft Flight Simulator, or actually not with the new one, the uh, X-Plane is the one I've been playing with in VR. Um, and it is, um, it, it's, I'm having a hard time landing planes. I gotta get, I, I still haven't figured out that spatial thing yet to get that done. And I need to get some lessons to learn how to do it properly. I'm getting the plane down, but I'm not hitting the runway the way I want to. I'm floating too much. I gotta, I gotta learn how to, how to fly better. Um, and Peflik asks, asks about um, uh, my Apple II GS monitor. Yeah, it is a little off center. And actually there's a reason why it is, because if I have it aligned properly, it reflects the studio lights that I have. So that's why it's off center a little bit so it doesn't reflect the light back into the camera. Um, Brian Parker says, the youngest daughter wants to do model rockets. I'm, yeah, I'm totally in, Brian. In fact, um, why don't we have an offline chat about this because I think this might be a gateway to get my, my oldest interested in it. Because she likes, she's really good at math and she likes computational things. So this might be a fun way for her to get an appreciation for some of this stuff. So. Maybe we'll play with that. Um, so what are they showing here on screen right now? I think they're just showing, uh, I think it's showing some, some B-roll of the second stage coming off there, it looks like. Yeah, I think all is good. And they are socially distancing there and having their masks on. We are in some crazy times, everybody. All right. Okay, folks, I'm going to uh, call it for now. I'm going to go uh, catch up with the family. They're down at the beach today, so it's a nice beach day. It's beautiful where I live, so I'm going to probably go find them. And uh, thank you, everybody, for tuning in. I want to thank our super chatters again, who include Alexander, Zam, and Imre. And I want to thank everyone for uh, watching on Amazon. And, you know, if you got into, you know, if this is one of the first space things you've seen, there's some great stuff. Um, and I would, again, I would start my kids off here because we have, we have to talk a little bit about stuff you can get, right? So Brian uh, is talking about model rockets, and I think I might um, pick up this uh, Alpha 3 rocket launch set. There is some assembly required, I think. Not a lot. You just glue it all together. But that's what's so fun about these things is that you can you glue it all together, you get it all ready to go, and then um, you get all the rocket engines you need. And this is, this is working exactly the same way it did 30 years ago, which I think is awesome. Like, you got to love products that haven't changed ever. Um, so what you do is you have an igniter and you um, attach the launch controller to it and so you don't have to light a match or anything. You have a key that closes the circuit and then you push a button on the controller. It's exactly the same as it was 30 years ago and that will light a little fuse. It kind of creates a short, lights the fuse and off the rocket goes. And now we've got, you know, high-speed cameras that can do 240 frames per second and stuff. And, I mean, that's stuff that I want to do. So uh, your kids can learn, like, you have to be out in a field like these folks are here. But you learn everything about rocketry, like how to get it to where you want it to go, right? Um, how to get it back. And what happens is there's a small um, charge in the rocket engine, the motor, they call them, that will pop off and it will push the nose cone off in the parachute so the rocket comes back down again. 
but you got to learn how to build the rocket and you got to choose the right engine for it. They have two stage, it's all sorts of stuff. And they've been doing, they've been around forever, but it's amazing that this is like, again, one of those products that never changes. It's always good. It was good 30 years ago. It's good now. Nothing fancy, right? So that's it. Okay, everybody, I'm going to uh, head off for the for the for now, um, but we'll be uh, some the weekly wrap up uh, tomorrow will be all about. I'll say goodbye to the Amazon folks. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, the weekly wrap up tomorrow. I think I'm going to do kind of a retrospective of some of my prior trips to NASA because I found a PowerPoint presentation that I did for um, I think I did it for a, a, a school assembly or something a couple of years ago, and it I think it's going to work great for the wrap up too. So I'm just going to do the PowerPoint that I had from that from back then. Um, it'll be kind of fun to talk about our NASA trips, and then maybe we'll uh, dive into the topic of commercial spaceflight in an upcoming episode, too. So, cool stuff. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for uh, tuning in, and I appreciate all of you. Thank you again for another Super Chat, Alexander, and uh, have a good afternoon and a great Sunday. Stay healthy. I think we're getting to the other side of this uh, pandemic thing. I actually went out to breakfast this morning. We have outdoor dining where I live, so I had a uh, Met up with a friend I hadn't seen in a while, and we were outside. Everybody was safe. It was good. It was, uh, it was great to just uh, reconnect with people again. We're, I think we're going to slowly get back to, to normal at some point. I'm optimistic about that. All right, so let me figure out how to shut down my, my stream here. I, I'm doing my stream differently with this new Amazon thing, so it's a little more complicated. That's why I started and then popped off. Um, so that's going to do it for now. We will be back again uh, very soon. So thanks for tuning in, everybody, and uh, really appreciate you all uh, being a part of this with me today. It was kind of fun to watch with uh, several hundred of you who are also into this. We'll see you soon.